Well, thank you um, for welcoming me and thank you for inviting me uh, to this. I'm very happy that uh, Filippo and Matteo and Sinyon and um, the people who started decided to make this move to um, to make this more, you know, more officially a topic of, you know, research, a topic of thinking, a topic of discussion, because I think there's so many interesting things to, so many interesting things to say and to share. And it was, um, yeah, it was really, I was really happy when I saw this um, initiative and, and I'm really happy that they, uh, they invited me. So thank you. Um, so there are not many, what I would say, super interesting things that I have to say today. I mean, I find them interesting, but I maybe not original, but I would like just to do a kind of reflection on what is this, what is, what's going on with this uh, linguistic justice, uh, justice thing. So um, bear with me, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna be putting here a little bit of, you know, a few loose thoughts trying to, um, um, make some sense at the end. So only recently, we all know um, um, that has, we have been paying attention uh, in philosophy and especially in analytic philosophy um, to this idea of how the global move to, towards English could be um, affecting um, people who do philosophy and specifically you know, diverse <laughs> practitioners and more specifically, I'm sorry, my cat, of course, is going to be part of uh, the thing. Um, Non-native speakers. Um, in this um, in this recent discussion, some people identify disadvantages and even injustice um, in these questions about how, for example, um, there is a bias or could be a biased perception uh, of people who speak with an accent or a biased perception of uh, the works that are written in um, peculiar uh, styles. Uh, there has been discussion online and blogs about possible disadvantages in publishing. Um, and even recently, uh, whereby Tim and Derelli are suggesting that there is an injustice related to our thought articulation. I, I'd say a little bit more about that. But there are also those who think that um, there is no special disadvantage that philosophy scholars, and in particular, analytic philosophers face, um, who are uh, analytic philosophers who are non-native speakers, that they face, um, that deserve the label of injustice. Um, for example, uh, Francesco Chiesa and Ana Elisabetta Galeotti in this special volume that Filippo and Enrico Terrone um, edited uh, in 2018, they argue that non-native speaker philosophers might be at a, at a relative disadvantage, but there's no injustice. They don't, they don't see injustice there. Um, although they see injustice when we think about prospective students who could be trying to enter the uh, profession, prospective students who are non-native speakers of English. So there has been some discussion, there are different positions. Um, and I, what I find, again, the, the main thing that I find, the main thing, one of the main things that I find interesting is the specific discussion of whether or not there is an injustice, there is something going on that deserves the label, the label of injustice. So, and that, that brings me to, you know, wider uh, questions about what is what ling linguistic justice mean, um, and what does it mean specifically in relation to the dominance of English in academia, um, and specifically in the, you know, in philosophy and in the analytic tradition. That is where it seems to be a more, um, uh, more of a big of an issue. Um, so, for example, I'm intrigued by questions like, is linguistic justice about the fair perception of uh, the written and spoken work of non-native speakers? Is that the goal? Um, is linguistic justice rather about resisting the dominance of English and aspiring to do philosophy in more languages because of its benefits? And for example, the, the, Diana Peret recently in this edited volume, uh, in 2018, um, she, she talks about um, the benefits of doing philosophy in more than one language. So there's also this thing, is linguistic justice, justice about that? Is that what we wanna uh, reach? Or is it rather about changing the political meaning of doing philosophy in English when you are a non-native speaker of English? 
And actually, what is that meaning? You know, I've heard people saying, well, you are, you know, you are succumbing to the imperialism, right? When you write and publish in English. Other people say, well, you just need to think about your career. Forget about, you know, putting, uh, um, seeing political meaning in that. Like, what is linguistic justice uh, um, in relation to the dominance of English in academia and specifically in philosophy? Um, so as part of this broad, broad reflection on injust, sorry, justice in philosophy in academia, um, I, there is this observation that hopefully uh, you also um, you share with me, uh, and if not, I would be very happy to um, to uh, to hear your thoughts on that. That the efforts that are being made in academia about you know related to diversity, equity, and uh, and inclusion are usually aimed at making institutional changes so that academia is more welcoming to diverse students and faculty. So the goal is to create this space that is equitable and that removes the barriers that exist. So we hear things about you know, recommendations on the language that we need to use on syllabi, recommendations on hiding practices that aim at improving uh, academia, improving the, um, the institution. And we also see, so again, bear, me, bear with me with this observation. Um, I, I'll tell you how that is related to the broader questions uh, that I put before. So these efforts you know, on diversity, inclusion, and equity um, are unfortunately perceived by many instructors um, as a matter of low, lowering the standards of academia. Like what you need to do if you're an instructor is that you need to make your classes easier and so that you know, students who struggle they can pass the course. Um, so I can, I mean, picture this grumpy instructor that unfortunately I've seen many of those uh, thinking, oh wow, all these efforts on diversity and inclusion, what they are telling me is that I need to lower my standards and distort the content of philosophy courses so that I adjust them to other people who actually have a problem that I don't have. Um, they have a problem and I need to adjust my courses and this, the whole standard of uh, uh, education to them. So this grumpy instructor, of course, is not questioning that their perception of what philosophy is, what it should be, how they are teaching philosophy. Um, I mean, it's, it's not questioning that and is seeing diverse students are just overly sensitive and overly weak. So this attitude uh, denies denies clearly the existence of inequality and inequity, but it also misses something that I think is, is, is critical, and that's where I, I like to put my attention. It misses the chance to improve. Uh, I mean, the, the instructor is, uh, uh, themselves, they, they miss the chance to improve as a, as a thinker and as an instructor of philosophy. Um, and yeah, beside being wrong about, you know, that, the, that means uh, spoiling or, you know, distorting philosophy. So the grumpy instructor could do this other thing that hopefully is what we all are gathered here are trying to do when we teach philosophy, if we are teaching something like, oops, you know, there's something here that I'm missing that I haven't paid attention. I haven't been paying attention before, uh, like how diverse students perceive the language that, for example, that I use in my classes or the images that I choose to put on my slides or the examples that I, that I use. For example, so what can I learn from that? Uh, is there an opportunity for me to enrich um, my practice and my teaching? So when it comes to non-native speakers of English in you know in anglophone uh, campuses and in academic events, so the framing that I uh, I think comes like by default is um, well they have a problem that they need to solve their English language command right. And we, we are happy to help. Let's see how we can help them. So let's offer them more English lessons. Let's offer them uh, writing and editing support on campus uh, so they don't have to pay editors or they don't have to um, take English lesson uh, outside of campus. So let's help them to solve the problem that they have. Um, and after these reflections on, on 
diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in academia. So my perception of this uh, is that first, the disadvantages, let's put aside whether those disadvantages constitute or not an injustice. We, I'm not gonna discuss that today. So th the disadvantages that non-native speakers face is it still not perceived as a part of the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. It's not, it's not considered to be part of that. And I think it should be, and I've argued about that uh, in a different work. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, talk uh, about that today, but there is this contrast that I see on you know, some campuses, uh, uh, like re showing like a lot of diversity pride also in their international students and their international faculty, but then they don't include them as part of diversity efforts. Uh, it's like I say, being a non-native is your problem, but all, all other diverse practitioners then is part of the uh, of the campus of the university to actually do something to change the culture of the university so they are more is more welcoming to them. But when it's about non-native speakers, it's like, well, take more English lessons and we will offer them for you to, for free. But it's still seen as not part of the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, effort. That's, that's, again, my observation. I'm, I'm happy to hear uh, different interpretations or different uh, examples of you know, different campuses or uh, places that is not like that. And also, it's obvious that there are two different framings. Um, and one is uh, very problematic, and the other one is really promising. So um, there is one framing that is, well, this is a, this is a problem that non-native speakers need to solve. And the different framing is, well, this is something academia needs to reflect on and use as a vehicle of change, as it happens with any other diverse uh, practitioner and student in philosophy. So this framing um, is the motivation for my reflections uh, today. So what I want to do is to pay attention to the experiences of uh, philosophers, philosophers who are um, specifically in the analytic tradition, philosophers who are non-native speakers of English and reflect on what is what we can learn from that uh, as instructors and as practitioners of philosophy and how can, how can that improve as, again, as practitioners and as teachers. So my proposal is that first that there's, there are important things we can learn from the experience of non-native speakers uh, of English uh, philosophers, again, I'm not going to say the whole sentence all the time, and I philosophers who are non-native speakers of English. <laughs> um, and that, you know, what we can learn from them uh, um, can enrich the practice and instruction of philosophy, and they can do that. That can, it, that can happen by calling into question some of the more or less explicit norms uh, that operate in the philosophy profession. And the second um, thought proposal thought is that we need to resist as much as possible framing the linguistic justice question in analytic philosophy as a question about well how can we make non-native speakers uh, of English more comfortable how can they how can we make them feel uh, better um, in academia like when they when they do philosophy or when they are in the classroom uh, because again, this framing has the, the hint of this grumpy instructor uh, perception of, oh, these people are just being too super sensitive or just, you know, they have some um, problem and um, we need to help them. So instead, uh, let's listen to their experiences without being in the defensive, as we should do with any other diverse practitioner. And that is an opportunity for us to become better philosophers because this is, I think, for me, it's pretty obvious that this is just another opportunity to do philosophy uh, about the, and that, that's what we are doing here. But you know, with this society, with this talk, that's what we are doing, doing philosophy about this. So this is if if even if just even for this, I think it's already worth engaging with this question uh, about what can I learn from reflecting on this issue. So I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on mostly on the first part, um, how we can learn things from non-native speakers uh, of English when they do philosophy. And what are, these, what are these norms in philosophy that are being called into question? And how can calling them into question, how can that improve the philosophy profession? So again, 
it's obvious there, there are norms in philosophy and they operate more or less you know, explicitly. And these norms shape the, the conceptions that, uh, for example, students have of philosophy when they come to the philosophy classroom. Um, so how are these conceptions that, uh, that students have affecting them when we are talking about diverse students? And I see that there are you know, a few implicit norms that are particularly bad for non-native speakers. Um, that's what, what I like to call, you know, the, uh, the proper English patrol. Uh, there is also the sounding smart and also the speed in thought articulation. I, I'll say more about each of these. So we, um, the work by Christy Dodson, this, this paper that uh, she published in 2012, um, was calling attention about how you know, philosophy is culture of justification, as he call it, and I, that I like to call philosophy border patrol. Um, is this idea that the philosophy discipline contains pretty strict norms, even if not explicit, that serve as gatekeepers? And they said, you know, what is they distinguish what is proper uh, uh, philosophy and what is non-proper philosophy. And this culture of justification, Dodson argues, makes professional philosophy a very difficult environment for diverse practitioners. I also um, see an, um, as English to be one of those gatekeepers, standard English, not even English in general, but standard English is one of those um, border patrols in philosophy. Because uh, again, in the, analytic, uh, in the analytic tradition, saying that doing philosophy in proper English um, is part of doing proper philosophy. Mm -hmm. So this, we can say it's relatively new norm, analytic philosophy is done in standard English, is also part of this culture of justification in philosophy and is going to be one of those gatekeepers. So there was this, uh, uh, this piece that um, Shen Yi Liao uh, wrote in 2018 uh, um, online in this medium uh, venue about how he was teaching this course, this introduction to philosophy course, and how students, many students reacted, uh, accusing the course or accusing him of, this is not philosophy. So this is just one example of how the culture of justification in philosophy works. Like students come to the classroom already with an idea of what philosophy is supposed to be. Um, and apparently they didn't, they didn't consider that the course that he was teaching was proper philosophy. And, the, uh, and that happened because he was, in his intro to philosophy course, he was not talking about Plato, Aristotle. He was talking about hermeneutical and testimonial injustice. He was talking about social construction, standpoint theory, pragmatics. And I'm, I'm just uh, on the slide, you see some of the authors that he said he, he made students read. And here are some of the comments that he got from students in students evalu uh, teaching evaluations, like taking this course felt more like taking a sociology course. Um, the first half of the class uh, wasn't even philosophy. Um, I would like to say at the beginning of the semester, I felt I'd been misled and was frustrated as I was expecting this course to revolve around the foundational philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, etc. Uh, so again, not surprising that students were like surprised by this content of the course because we all know that that's what people think philosophy is. So we have these again norms of philosophy that shape the conceptions of philosophy that people have specifically students when they come to our classes. So but how how does how are those like these norms and these conceptions of philosophy shaped by those norms? How do they affect? Um, when people are uh, again, I, I, as you see, I'm, I'm really, I'm really focusing on students and teaching. It's obvious that I work in a teaching institution, and that's you know my main thing. Um, so how do they affect? How do they enter into the philosophy classroom? And specifically, how, did, how do they affect diverse practitioners? And again, my focus is mostly non-native speakers of English, but I'm gonna talk how I'm gonna uh, talk about how this affects in general to any non. Uh, uh, let's say, diverse practitioners. So there is this paper that I found super interesting, uh, published in 2017, uh, that is titled, What Counts as Math? 
relating conceptions of math with anxiety about math. So these are a group of people at UC Berkeley. And what they suggest is that there is an inverse relation between how broad your math conception is and math anxiety. So math anxiety, they define it as the tension or fear associated with the prospect of doing math. And it is associated with math avoidance and low performance and with women, and women are disproportionately affected by that. Not surprisingly, that this is, you know, ideas and conceptions about who is good at math and anyway. So what they did in this study is that they measure math conception by asking students, so what conception of math they have by asking students to indicate whether an activity involves or, or does not involve uh, math. For example, swimming, playing soccer, sailing. And the more activities are, that are classified as, uh, as in, involving math, the broader the math conception is, you know, is taken to be. So they also asked uh, the participants to, um, to rate how good they are at those activities. And what they found, and I'm quoting, is a significant negative correlation between math anxiety and mean self-assessment, or sorry, self-assessed skills for items the individual was able to relate to math. That is, and I continue quoting, these results suggest that math anxiety is related both to how expansive individuals perceive math to be and how skillful they feel at the activities they think it could involve. So there's some comments we could make about this, you know, uh, uh, different interpretation of these results. We can say, well, might be that what is actually happening here is that if you are actually bad at math, <laughs> that is what drives your anxiety, but I really like this idea of, I mean, I think there is something going on here and I didn't follow on the uh, on recent studies that they've been making, they've been doing on this. Um, but I think, I think, I mean, I hypothesize that something similar could be happening in philosophy in the sense that the narrower we take philosophy, legitimate philosophy to be, I think the more anxiety is gonna call, is gonna provoke in people when I mean when students when they come to the classroom, thinking about what well, I you know in order to do good philosophy in order to be a good philosopher in order to do what to do well in this course I need to do I need to be good at this set of skills, and not any other thing like only these sets. So it's obvious that in philosophy is really narrow uh, about you know where uh, you do philosophy um who does philosophy what do you do philosophy for what do you feel what you do philosophy about uh how you do philosophy specifically how you write and how you communicate philosophy and i think it's reasonable to think that diverse practitioners and in particular non-native speakers are going to be disproportionately affected by this narrow conception of philosophy that these norms create. Um, so if we have this super narrow conception of what philosophy is and how you communicate philosophy, I think, uh, again, in standard English, in a special style, uh, sounding very eloquent, I think that's going to create anxiety <laughs> and a lot of anxiety in non-native speakers. Also, um, because th there is this, I'm going to talk more about the narrow conception of philosophy. So, again, we can, in very broad strokes, uh, have at least two conceptions of philosophy, and many more in between, um, about the content of philosophy, about the methodology of philosophy, about what are the features of uh, its practitioners. So, in a narrow uh, conception of philosophy, philosophy is usually detached from reality. It only addresses uh, abstract questions. Um, philosophy is constituted by a specific tradition, you know, in analytic philosophy, this anglophone a tradition of thought. And, it, and philosophy requires very specific skills, like, for example, logical and formal argumentation, uh, having really good communication skills of, in a standard English. Um, and we have, on the other hand, a very much more broader. Um, a conception of philosophy in which philosophy has practical relevance. It can involve different traditions of thought and there are different skills that can be relevant for the philosophical practice, like creativity, like listening skills, like being a good listener or 
performing epistemic resistance, which is, you know, I'm thinking about Jose Medina and Christy Dodson work when they mention specific resistance and, uh, and specifically Christy Dodson talk about what, we, what is what we need to overcome what she calls contributory injustice. I'm not going to go into that because that would take me too long, but this kind of open mind that at times might feel as if you are going against your perception of reality. Like when you listen to someone, doesn't sound, you know, credible. Um, but you suspect you might be not giving them the proper credibility. Like you need to really like go against your own perception and say, I need to be much more open to maybe I'm missing something. Maybe it's not that they're not credible. It's that I'm missing something. There is something that I don't know here. So this capacity, I think, is part or should be part of this much more broader uh, conception of philosophy together with being a good listener and having creativity, for example. So again, how expansive do we think philosophy is? Like we can have this orange circle, orange subset of skills, like philosophy is about dealing with a logic problem. It's about writing an analytic um, uh, analysis paper or a much broader uh, set of skills uh, and, and activities in which, you know, where we think that philosophy is about representing concepts or questions uh, in drawings, for example, or in stories. Our philosophy is also about reflecting on how you use your language um, or about searching for conceptual tools to articulate new experiences. Like that is philosophy. It's not just you know, some kind of weird um, medi meditative process. Um, so you know, could anti-racist activism involve philosophy? Could your struggles figuring out your own identity could be could be part of philosophy? Could the process of articulating thoughts while you are a non-native speaker, could that have philosophical value? Um, you know, I'm not gonna go into this. I'm gonna skip the, the brilliance. So there is this feature of philosophy that is particularly bad for non-native speakers. And this is something that uh, Mahisha Sherry and Eric Sweets gave up. Uh, when they wrote, I think it was in the New York Times, this piece in 2016 about seeming smart and sounding smart and how white men are much better at seeming smart because they have a better command of the cultural apparatus of seeming smart. Um, so this idea of sounding smart, again, I think is, is, is so bad for non-native speakers because we don't sound smart a lot of the times. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, all non-native speakers sound like me, but we have, we know a lot, there's a lot of research showing how when you perceive someone speaking with an accent, your perception of that person uh, is as someone that is not as competent as someone who speaks with no accent in their, in whatever native language uh, uh, they are talking, they're speaking. So when a non-native speaker speaks, you know, is giving a talk, uh, or is writing a piece of work and start using this peculiar style and mm, you might say weird constructions, it doesn't sound as smart or you say eloquent. I think maybe eloquence is, is critical. This word is critical here. So if we, if we take philosophy to be critically about sounding smart, being eloquent, uh, non-native speakers, you know, I do. Um, and maybe in philosophy is especially um, bad because in philosophy, we, we, don't, we don't have most of the time, we don't have data to support our arguments. All we have is, is we need to sound credible, we need to sound eloquent, we need to sound smart when we are providing, you know, we are putting forward a proposal, an argument, we don't have data to support that. So if we don't sound uh, good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we are dumb. So, um, what they argue, actually, Sherry and uh, Sweet Gevel in that piece is that women and people of color, um, they face a very powerful obstacle um, when they are writing and presenting their ideas because of this culture of, you know, seeming smart is all you need or is the most important thing you, uh, you need to do philosophy and to, uh, to, to be perceived as a good philosopher. But I think that, is also, that also applies to non-native speakers, and I think it's especially bad for them too. So let me um, let me say something now about speed and thought articulation, which I think is two two, two other uh, implicit um, norms of philosophy that I think are really bad for non-native speakers. So uh, Chala Chimenderelli, in a manuscript that I read recently, she argues that non-native speakers experience a much more effortful process of thought articulation 
because they might, they, they need to look for linguistic tools, you know, they, they may have the concept in their native language or in some implicit form, but then they need to look for linguistic tools uh, in, the, in, in English um, and that take a lot of effort. Sometimes they need to make really big compromises. You know, she, she says about how she struggles sometimes to, uh, or, or she talks about a specific example. Uh, I don't know if it is a personal example of uh, talking about uh, in general, how sometimes you want to express a thought, but you don't find the linguistic tools that you that really, really convey that thought. So you need to compromise and say, maybe this is good enough to express what I have in mind. So I'm going to go for this. Uh, but then you need to be testing all the time. Like, is that what I is that the best way to convey what I what I had in mind? So all this effort, she talks about how that provokes a lot of frustration, um, um, and that that uh, compromises a lot, like the 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 very process of doing philosophy um, for non-native speakers. Um, and I think there is a lot we can say about that about how thought articulation can be more effortful for non-native speakers. And what does that mean? First, is that the case? Second, what does that mean? So what was, she uses that to say there is an injustice going on there. Uh, and what I like to reflect on is uh, in a more broader question about what does that mean? Could that be actually something that we can, that we can give value to? Like could the very process of articulating your thoughts when you are a non-native speaker could that have philosophical value? I think it does. I think it's super cool when you are articulating your thoughts and you are like going through different linguistic tools that is not in a native language. Sometimes you try to translate, then you realize not translated is not the way I want to go. And then you might actually, um, you might actually realize that um, a, a, of a lot of things in, in the way, in that very process, in that very reasoning of articulating, sorry, that very process of articulating your thoughts, I think there is a lot of philosophy you are doing. So I think we should not miss that. We should not just leave that as part of, oh, this is a struggle non-native speakers go through. Let's see what we can learn from that. Maybe, the, maybe that has philosophical value. And I, do, I think it does. So I really like the uh, Chimenderelli uh, work. I'm paying attention to this process of articulating thoughts because I think there is a lot of philosophical value we can take there. And that is something that many other people can mm, contribute to that, but non-native speakers maybe have a special, unique contribution to that, uh, to that value. Um, and also there is this idea of speed. Like we value a lot the speed in philosophy, like conferences, in the classroom, like the first people who just, you know, raise their hand, you're like, oh, they are so fast. Right away, they thought about a response. Right away, they thought about uh, a problem with my uh, theory. La and, and, and we all enjoy, I mean, if we are a, you're a philosopher, most likely you enjoy these fast conversations where, you know, you talk over each other and it's super cool and there's so much fun. I love those. But it's really high speed a proof of you know that person being a better philosopher or smarter or really understanding the thing that the things that are going on like this is clearly bad for non-native speakers uh in i mean I mean, we can we can make a lot of you know we can uh draw a lot of distinctions here about you know what you can be a non-native speaker in many different ways right you can have an amazing command of english you can have medium command i mean i think there is a lot of gray you know areas there but in general, I, I, I will talk about my own case. Uh, not all non-native speakers might en encounter this trouble, but I, 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 I encounter that a lot. Like I wanna say something, but sometimes like, oh, I don't even know how to articulate that. It takes me a while to, to, you know, to put things together in my mind and to be able to express them in English in the way that I think better convey my thought. So um, speed, I think this value we give to speed in conferences, in, in online discussions, and in the classroom, I think it's really detrimental for uh, non-native speakers. And again, this is not about lowering the standards. This just, you know, let's just relax this defensive reaction and think, can we learn something from that? Maybe there is not that much value that a speed has. Maybe that is not it. There's that, maybe that makes conversations faster and maybe super fascinating and, you know, thrilling. But maybe that doesn't have any philosophical value there. That doesn't, doesn't show that the person is smarter or better philosopher or, you know, better at thinking. It's not maybe a better thinker. 
um, maybe people who are shy and they take their time to talk or they, they maybe they, they want to relate to this uh, uh, even better, not necessarily being a non-native speaker. So anyway, we need new norms for philosophy. Uh, new norms about what it is to sound smart, uh, not necessarily being a native speaker, right? Like you can sound smart by having a um, um, an accent. You can sound smart by writing in peculiar styles. And instead of encountering like, oh, that sounds weird. I think this person might not have a good idea of what they are talking about. Rather say like, whoa, that's a very interesting way of explaining that. Wow, that's a very creative way of us. Uh, I've never thought about, uh, you know, writing this in this way. That's interesting. Um, so we need new norms for what is relevant or appropriate to do in philosophy and what it is to do to make sorry, a good philosophical contribution and what is valuable in philosophy. So specifically, I think the process of articulating a thought, which again, as Tim Mendeley argues, can be really effortful for non-native speakers and can contribute to a lot of frustration and, and, and struggle, I think can be, I think it should be part of the philosophical process. Like how did you get there? How did you get to, how did you get to that thought or to that idea? Not just the reasoning, but how did you articulate that thought? I think that uh, can have a lot of philosophical value. Um, and we need to find ways to minimize the weight that speed has in the classroom and philosophy events. Again, that's my, my, my opinion. Maybe some people think that that would kill, that would be a kill joy uh, for philosophy. I don't think so. Um, um, and maybe we need to introduce more non-English concepts in our practice and our teaching instead of always translating them and once in a while using some Latin word, uh, you know, when we talk about ancient philosophy, maybe we need to just use a lot of concepts in, in different languages uh, so that we take students out of the English bubble. It's like maybe you don't, you don't have to translate everything into English. Maybe you need to learn other concepts in other languages. So again, back to my proposal and just summarizing and finalizing, there are ma many important things that I think we can learn from how diverse practitioners do philosophy and experience the norms of philosophy, and in particular, how non-native speakers of English do that. And this, observing that, paying attention to that, I think it can enrich philosophy. It's not, again, a matter of distorting philosophy to make it easier uh, for them. No, it's a matter of how we can enrich and make philosophy better. Uh, and that is by, I think, calling into question some of the norms that operate uh, in this uh, profession and by expanding our conception of philosophy, like what has value in philosophy and what is where, in which areas of your life can you do philosophy? And also we need to resist, as I mentioned before, this framing of the question of linguistic justice as being a question about how to make the profession more comfortable for non-native speakers, how to make them feel more accepted. I think instead we need to just listen to their experiences, like the reflections that Jim and Dele does about how a non-native speaker might try to articulate a specific thought and all this process of going back and forth about this, you know, if I say in this way, but in my native language, that conveys these other things, but in this other language, that doesn't convey these, you know, tiny differences, like all that process. Listen, let's listen to how that happens. And maybe there's a lot we can learn from that in order to, you know, and take that as lessons about how to improve our uh, profession, our own doing philosophy and our teaching. And that's it. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. <laughs>